Hello, and thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment, and it really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Today's episode is a bit longer, so I'm just going to jump right in to the business spotlight. Today, the spotlight is on the Darcy Project. Here is what the founder, Stephanie, had to say. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie. I wanted to talk to you a little bit today about my daughter, Darcy. My husband, Jesse, and I had our fourth daughter in April of 2017. But let me start at the beginning. We have three beautiful daughters, our first being born in 2008, our second being born in 2010, and our third being born in 2014. Our first three pregnancies were normal and had no complications. We found out we were pregnant in September of 2016. We miscarried shortly after we found out. Then in December of 2016, we found out that we were pregnant with our daughter Darcy, making her our fourth girl. I had a very nauseous pregnancy and other complications around 11 weeks, but we went on and made it to our 19 week appointment, which went by with flying colors. Two weeks later, I went in for a heart rate checkup and unfortunately she was gone. At the moment that we found out that she was gone, your world stops completely and you have no idea what to do next. During the time in the doctor's office, I was given many options. I was told I could go home, spend time with family before I needed to make it to the hospital, but I decided I couldn't return home in the condition that I was in. So I decided to drive myself to the hospital and my husband was able to meet me there. Once we got to the hospital, they were able to do another ultrasound just to confirm that there was not still a heartbeat. I was holding on to the last bit of hope that she would still have a heartbeat and that there was some kind of mistake. But after confirming with a few ultrasounds, she had passed away. As I was giving birth, the doctor mentioned that she had already been passed in utero for about two weeks. I noticed really simple things about her that I still remember today. She had blondish, reddish hair and was just so petite and adorable. We were able to spend the day with her in the hospital and we're so thankful for the staff that was able to capture pictures of us and her together. At the time, I didn't really think I wanted them, but they encouraged me that they would take the photos and they would put them on a CD for us. That way, if we wanted to access them later on in life, we could. And I'm so glad that I did because I was able to make a personal scrapbook for us and just have those photos of us for the short time that we were able to spend with her. We found out a few weeks after giving birth that we had a placental abruption and a problem with the umbilical cord, which is what caused her not to survive. We look at life very different every day and realize that our life won't ever be the same. We try not to take things for granted and we hope that we can help others who have been through this same type of journey. We created the Darcy Project in her memory and we hold an annual walk in October along with Easter basket drives and toy drives around Christmas time. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing about your organization with us. Today, I am talking with Lindsay. She struggled with infertility and went through several rounds of failed medicated cycles with no clear answer as to why she couldn't get pregnant. She then had one living child, followed by the neonatal loss of her son, Gus, due to polycystic kidney disease. Lindsay shares her experience finding out the diagnosis, going through the pregnancy, and the time following her loss. Hello, everyone. Today, I am here with Lindsay. Lindsay, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hello. My name is Lindsay. I am a family nurse practitioner. Uh, I live in South Dakota. I have a husband, Lance. He's a nursing supervisor. Um, We both work at our local clinic and hospital here in South Dakota. We have been married for seven years. Um, We have two children, um, our living son, Henry, and he is three years old. And we 
our son, Gus, he was born seven weeks ago today, actually. Um, and he's our angel baby. Can you talk a little bit about your last story? Yes. So we kind of have a conglomeration of loss and fertility. Um, and then of course, since we have our son, Henry parenting after loss, we battled infertility, um, with both of our sons. We tried for at least a year, a little over, I, I forget the exact time frame for both of them, but at least a year, um, for both of them with Henry, we tried for at least that year and we spontaneously got pregnant. Um, we were going to start fertility medications such as Clomid. Lucky enough, it, it just happened. And his pregnancy was a breeze um, other than, you know, it's your first pregnancy and you don't know what to expect. I am not a great pregnant person with either of my boys. I, I just am, I don't feel good when I'm pregnant. I am large. But um, other than that, Henry was was a great pregnancy. Born at 40 weeks, eight pounds, 15 ounces. He was, he's beautiful. Um, and then with Gus, we tried trying to conceive him. Um, I want to say Henry was one and a half to two when we tried with him. And after about six months of trying, we had decided, um, I went to my OB and we were going to start Clomid and we did about three cycles of Clomid and my progesterone was actually declining with each cycle of Clomid. Um, that I was on, which, which was really strange. So after we had been watching my labs and my progesterone was consistently decreasing, my OB that I was seeing had decided to refer us to reproductive endocrinology. And being in South Dakota, we live in a rural area. My husband and I both work in rural medicine. So we actually, um, we had to travel three hours south of us to get to our reproductive endocrinologist. So um, we made that appointment, screened for PCOS, any potential causes of why we were not getting pregnant. And she couldn't really give us a clear answer. She was, she was great. She was very sweet, very thorough. So the plan after that appointment was to do like an HSG screening um, or a dye study essentially to make sure that um, my uterus fallopian tubes to make sure that everything was functioning how it should be. And at that appointment, she actually did an ultrasound and she said, well, it looks like you're going to be ovulating here within the next four to seven days. I want to say is what she said. So my husband and I took that with a grain of salt, of course, and, uh, took action that, and I want to say it was four weeks later, I actually got sick with influenza A and I wondered why nobody else in our house was sick, why Henry wasn't sick. My husband wasn't sick. And that's when we found out that we were pregnant with Gus. Um, so right, right before Thanksgiving 22. So that was fun to surprise my husband with that. So, you know, we told our family on Thanksgiving that we were expecting. They of course know that we have struggled with both boys to get pregnant. So they were very excited as well. Everything with pregnancy wise was great, you know, other than the very common morning sickness, which subsided. And then at my, <clears throat> at our 20 week, um, ultrasound, um, our anatomy scan, everything was looked great. There was bilateral renal dilation noted on the 20 week anatomy scan. And me as a family nurse practitioner, I, I read ultrasound reports. I look at the radiology findings and whatnot. So that anatomy scan was Friday and the report came back around Friday at 3 PM. So I'm reading through the report and it's the radiologist is saying he found the bilateral renal dilation. And in his comments, he actually noted that this is commonly associated with trisomy 21 and more or less recommending a repeat ultrasound at 32 weeks. You know, Friday at 3 p.m., 
you're going into the long weekend and you're probably not going to hear back from your doctor. So that was anxiety driving. But, uh, you know, other than that, I didn't have many concerns. And once my doctor called me back with those results, she was completely confident with following that recommendation. We were told this is a common finding. Uh, Most of the time, the bilateral renal dilation will improve and it's fine, especially with how his was measuring. Um, We did not know he was a boy. We chose not to find out. But so from... From there, we just had our subsequent OB visits, and I want to say it was the 24-week visit. I just, you know, asked again, you know, the the renal dilation, it's it's fine, um, making sure that we were doing all the right things. She once again reassured us that it's, it's common, and so we were going to be having that repeat ultrasound at would be about eight weeks, I believe. So I was looking forward to that, to seeing how that was going to go. So in that time frame, we were just preparing for baby. Of course, it's different um, when you already have a toddler at home. But I was actually at work on May 3rd. And I work in both our hospital and our clinic. Um, and I work very closely. I'm very good friends with my nurse, who um, when I'd come back to the clinic for the afternoon, I had just told her that I didn't I didn't necessarily feel the baby moving as much, which I thought was odd. Both of them, Henry and Gus, they had both been very active, active babies in the womb, I guess. So it was just odd. It was a different day. So I was, you know, kind of drinking cold water, pushing on my belly gently, of course, trying to get him to move and, and he would move. So went through the rest of my day, came home, told my husband, or playing outside with my son. And we live near my mother-in-law. So I told her as well. And, you know, trying to remain positive, you know, that everything's okay. And my, my husband had just said, you know, maybe, maybe you should call the clinic tomorrow. Um, it, it never hurts to check. Right. So the next day um, I had happened to have the day off, take my son to daycare. I'm going to come home and do some, some tours. And I kind of held off a little bit um, while I was at home. I, I thought maybe I was just overthinking things. Once again, tried to drink cold water, lie down, and then I would feel him move, which was more reassuring. But I just, I thought I'd take the advice of my husband, thought, what the heck, I'll call the clinic. Um, So I called my OB clinic at the clinic that I work at, of course, and they got me in for an ultrasound um, within an hour. They wanted to do a BPP or a biophysical profile. Um, So they would check heart, lungs, um, everything. So I ran in for that visit, of course, just oblivious to life. Now that I look back on it, go back with the ultrasound tech and I know her personally as well. So we're, we're chatting, we're talking and she's, I I didn't realize anything was wrong now that I look back on it, which of course, listening to your podcast and other people's stories, you know, they kind of describe how they could, they could read the ultrasound text face and they knew something was wrong. And and I had no idea, which thankfully it was, it was nice that in that moment to kind of, you grasp every piece of joy that you can, I think. Yeah. Looking back on it. So, um, but anyways, she's still doing the ultrasound and one of my providers that I had been following OB care with, um, a fellow nurse practitioner, um, she walks in the room. And of course, working in healthcare and um, being a nurse practitioner, I deliver not so fun news to people all the time. So when she walked in the room, I, I, I knew something was not okay. So she sat down in the chair next to me and she told me that I had essentially no amniotic fluid and, or she told me my amniotic fluid is very low. And I thought, okay, you know, they're on the ultrasound, there's heartbeat and everything. So, so I didn't, yes, I work in healthcare, but OB is not my field. So in my mind, I'm, I'm waiting for the next thing of, of how, how detrimental is this news? So she essentially told me that she wanted to have me go to the hospital overnight. Um, She told me my fluid level, I believe that ultrasound was 1.5. And like I said, I don't, I don't work in in the OB field. So I had asked her, well, what's a normal level? And she told me 10 was where it should be at. So very, very low fluid. 
and she had expressed at that time we were concerned that of course it was the baby's kidneys that were impacting my low fluid because of what was found on the 20 week anatomy scan. So my husband works in the clinic as well. Um, he was stuck in a meeting of course, but he came, came over shortly after. And so I kind of hit him with this news all at once as well. So we, we took it with what it was. We walked over to the hospital and I was put on the monitors. Um, baby was doing great. They wanted to observe me overnight. Um, and they actually, they wanted to air flight me, um, to Sioux Falls that day. Um, but with baby looking so good, um, and they contacted who would be my future MFM in Sioux Falls. And he was agreeable to observe me overnight and see me the following day. So I stayed in the hospital, observed baby. He was great. Perfect. I believe I got about three liters of fluid. It wanted to try to give me some IV fluids to see if that would help bring up the amniotic fluid at all. And of course we would find out that it didn't, um, it didn't make a difference or, or anything. Um, so the next day I had family, um, drive me three hours South, um, again, and I remember getting roomed, um, in the ultrasound room, the nurse of the MFM. And I, I still remember being so positive, um, at that point and not, I don't know if I didn't, I just didn't want to believe that there was something wrong or I, I really truly believed that everything would be okay. Um, so I remember talking to the nurse and, you know, she asked if I had any questions and, or she asked if I, if there was certain things that I didn't want to do or what I was comfortable with essentially. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially okay with doing whatever, um, to make sure we keep this baby, this baby in at, um, till 40 weeks. Um, I was at about 30 weeks when we found all this out. So, and I just remember her looking at me and her saying, we might be, we might be delivering a baby today. And my, my husband wasn't with me at that appointment, um, because we had a son home, of course. Um, so we both had agreed that it was best to, to keep him in his routine and whatnot. So it was, that was kind of the first initial shock of, okay, this pregnancy is, is not okay, essentially. So the MFM came in, there was an ultrasound tech before him that did an ultrasound. Of course, um, uh, my fluid had not changed. She told me that the MFM would be coming in. Um, he came in, he very thorough every time would do his own ultrasound, um, looked at the baby's kidneys, looked at the baby's heart. There was a small amount of urine in the bladder, but at that, at that time, um, or after he did his ultrasound, he, um, had voiced his concern that Gus had polycystic kidney disease. So essentially small cysts, um, or pockets of fluid that were in both of his kidneys, um, that were likely developing um, at that 20 week anatomy scan, um, when the bilateral renal dilation was noted, there weren't cysts or anything noted at that time, but that was the determination now at 30 weeks to confirm the diagnosis or other genetic conditions to do genetic testing, which we had deferred early on, you would typically get an amniocentesis, but with me having no amniotic fluid, not only is that high risk, um, in itself, um, but it's even more high risk when, if we would take that small amount of fluid that I would have. So the recommendation at that time, he really wanted me to, he knew that we had a toddler at home. He really wanted me to be able to do this, um, from three hours away because my NSTs or my non-stress tests and ultrasounds had all been normal other than the findings with the kidneys. So I was down there on a Friday and he wanted to admit me to their hospital. So I was on a high rob or a high risk OB unit. And I was there Friday night and the plan was to let me go home the next day. And he wanted me, when I came home, he wanted me to get ultrasounds twice a week. And then I would be doing the non-stress tests three times a week at our clinic here back home. Um, and I was completely fine with that. I wanted to be at home as long as I could. And he wanted to deliver at 
36 or 37 weeks. Um, he had voiced his concern then that the biggest complication with polycystic kidney disease with the amniotic fluid being depleted essentially is lung development. Of course, working in healthcare, knowing that if you don't have lungs, you, you, you really can't sustain life. Um, so the reassuring point, and he was very positive in the whole outlook of this, the reassuring point being that at 20 weeks, my amniotic fluid level was normal. And then at 30 weeks, almost 30 weeks finding that it was almost zero. So the question we had was, when did it go down? Because lung development um, in the womb is around that 24 week mark. So we were really hoping that my amniotic fluid hung on for at least those four weeks and we would have a good amount of lung development. So after that night stay, I came home. Uh, my husband came down with my son and got me. We came back home. I had an ultrasound that Monday. It it wasn't that different than it was from the weekend prior. We had stress tests on that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we work my husband and I both work very closely with these physicians and nurses in our clinic. And so they were all, they were all great. Statistically, um, the news that we were given while I was down in Sioux Falls that first time is we had a one in three chance of having a stillbirth. If we would make it to 36 or 37 weeks, Gus would likely need um, renal dialysis. And if he didn't tolerate renal dialysis, uh, the pediatric hospice team would likely come visit with us. Um, and we would, of course, discuss end of life cares. Um, if he did tolerate dialysis, okay. Uh, between my husband and I, we would likely be in the NICU for a period of time until we could find a hospital that would accept him, accept him for a transplant. So coming back home and, and talking with the physicians and nurses that we work really closely with, it, it was our whole world was turned upside down, right? You learn essentially within three days that your pregnancy that you thought was completely fine is, is not. And the, our MFM in Sioux Falls had essentially told us this is going to be hard on your marriage, no matter what happens. Um, it's going to be hard on your child that you have at home. It's, it's going to affect your, your life no matter what. So we came back home and the ultrasound that I had that Friday. So it would be a week from when we found everything out. Of course, it showed essentially no amniotic fluid. So I once again was admitted at our local hospital, um, but I was only um, observed for about four hours at that point. And the OB on call that night had actually, um, I'll never forget what he said. He had told us that it's really nice to give birth to a live baby. So once again, working in rural medicine, you know, when you get a diagnosis like this, our team really wanted to do as much as they could for us. If you research um, autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, the likelihood of survival is, I don't know exact statistics, but it's not a great outcome. Um, it's very grim. So our providers here had actually give us the option of delivering Gus at that point, um, knowing that he would likely not make it, but they really wanted us to give the chance an opportunity to, to love on him and, and whatnot. So with him, you know, telling us it's really great to give birth to a live baby, we, we took that news home over the weekend and that was Mother's Day weekend um, this year, which was hard. We thought on that, we talked it over with our family. I think we had truly come to peace with that a little bit, if that happened. I knew deep down somewhere that didn't feel like the right choice though. Not that that's not the right choice for some people, but it didn't feel right to me. So the following Monday, um, had another ultrasound here in, in our hometown where we live. And my OB had called my MFM because it was the same findings, essentially no amniotic fluid, but he looked great. Otherwise, you know, he did great pra practice breathing. Um, heart looked good. There was small amount of urine in the bladder. So she had called my MFM for more guidance. Essentially, we don't have a NICU. 
where I live. We just don't deal with cases like this at all, really. So he had once again um, wanted me to come down for an appointment the next day. So I made another three hour trip <laughs> down south of us. And after that ultrasound and visit with him, he had decided that it would be best if I would stay in Sioux Falls and I would come into his clinic um, every day to get a stress test. And then I would have weekly visits with him. I of course saw him after my stress test and whatnot, but formal visits would be once a week. And then I would have still ultrasounds twice a week. So that was difficult knowing that I would have to be away from my son. We were 31 and some odd days. I don't remember exactly almost 32 weeks um, at that point. So we were about two weeks into learning all this news. So knowing that I was going to be away from home for a month um, until delivery that time, it was, we were looking at delivery of 36 weeks. Um, He was breached the whole time. So we were, the plan was to deliver um, by C-section, not only because he was breached, Um, But because with no amniotic fluid, he likely would not flip. And then of course, with the C-section, he didn't have the potential of, of getting stuck in and whatnot. So at that time, my husband and I decided it, that was the best thing to do. Um, We wanted to do everything to give our son the best possible outcome that he could. So I was lucky enough to have family that helped find housing down there. And my husband would come visit me on the weekends with our son and I I will never forget uh, the relationship that you build with not only your provider MFM, and I know everybody's experience is so different. Um, Every provider is different, but I really got close with these people. Um, You know, I didn't have family. I didn't have any family down where I was staying. All my family was back here three hours north. So these were essentially the people that I saw every day for my non-stress tests. I got to hear his heartbeat every day. Um, for four weeks. And then of course, getting ultrasounds, you know, getting to see his, his face and looking back now, those once again, you, you look back at how much hope um, and the small glimmers of joy that you, you had at that time, you, you miss it, of course. So after about those four weeks, I got to come home the last two weekends of our four week stint. We were at that 36 week mark. Um, I remember the morning before I left to go back, which we were going to be about four days from three or four days from delivery at that point, taking our last pictures at home as a family, last belly pictures. Um, I should note before I even moved to Sioux Falls, I had a, I have a great friend who's a photographer and she takes beautiful maternity pictures and beautiful maternity gowns. So with us not knowing if our pregnancy would end in stillbirth or or how it it would end, I guess. Um, She was kind enough to come take maternity pictures um, at about that 30 week mark. So, but essentially we had reached um, 36 weeks. We had family stay at home with my son. We had family come down as well to be there for delivery. We came down the night before. We kind of had what we maybe thought was our last uh, date night for a long while. Mm -hmm. Um, We didn't know where where this journey was going to take us you know, we kind of had to look at this, this could have gone so many different ways. So we had to look at, you know, potentially my husband or I living in, in the NICU with our son, and then one parent staying back here with, with Henry and the other parent being with Gus in the NICU, of course. So, and the nearest place, if we, if we were going to reach transplantation for Gus, the nearest location would be um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota at U of M um, hospital. So that's about six hours away. So in the grand scheme of things, our, our family would not be close. And we kept him in the womb for thir- until 36 weeks, of course, to, to try to get his weight up. Um, and he looks so good other than his kidneys in the womb. Babies need to be a certain weight before they would undergo transplantation. So that was the goal in keeping him in so long. So we had our last date night. We went in the following morning to the hospital in Sioux Falls and I together. And I will, I had everything in a huge suitcase from me being down in Sioux Falls for a month and my husband packed a bag as well. So we're these two people sitting in this hospital lobby with these two large suitcases and every, I'll, I'll just never forget everybody staring at us looking like we're crazy, (laughs) but you don't know how long you're going to be in the NICU. Right. So I'd kind of just packed everything. 
So my husband and I went back to get ready for um, our C-section. Had a great nurse, um, very well-seasoned nurse who had seen a lot. Um, so kind um, in preparing us, visited with Deja team. They were monitoring me on the TOCO monitors, of course. And Gus looked great, great heart rate. He had great accelerations. He never had decelerations throughout our, throughout the whole month that I was there. And he would have hiccups all the time, I remember. Um, I apologize, I'm jumping around quite a bit, but... No, that's fine. <laughs> you know, he would have hiccups and um, whatnot. And I just remember other nurses saying that's a really great sign of lung development. Um, like I said, he had great practice breathing on all of his ultrasounds. So so optimistic, you know, always, of course, always within the back of my mind, knowing that the worst could be a potential outcome, but he, he, he just looked so great. He was such a strong baby. He was growth wise, you know, 90th percentile. Um, he was, he was just so great. Once we were getting prepped for the C-section, I, I felt um, like I said, at that point, I had a really great relationship with my MFM. He was really honest. He was so optimistic throughout the whole course of this. So I'll never forget. He came in to see me before our C-section and he had said exactly that. He said, I hope you know um, that I've tried to remain really optimistic throughout this whole experience. He had seen another case very similar to this. And I remember at that 30 week mark, when I first met him, he had said that the case he had seen before this mom got to go home with, with a baby. So that was another part in keeping my optimism. And it helped that he was optimistic as, is along with his nurses. So he, you know, he said exactly that he, he wanted me to know that he's been optimistic throughout this whole time. And he also looked at me and he, he said, you've, you've done your job. You've carried this baby this far. Um, you've done all you can do and you've done your job. And in the, you know, in the moment, I was so excited to meet my baby. I heard the words that he said, but it didn't really resonate with me then. Um, it obviously hits home later now that we don't have Gus here, but he was also great. And he had personally talked with our NICU team. Um, he wanted everybody there and to be ready um, for anything that could possibly happen. I had met with a genetic team, our geneticist, um, pediatric, nephro pediatric nephrology. I had visits with them before even having our C-section, obviously. Um, so all of those people were ready. Our plan was to do genetic testing with Gus. And the plan was to obtain the blood sample from his cord blood, since I, of course, didn't get an amniocentesis. And I, I just remember him being slightly irritated because my C-section was delayed a little bit because we were waiting for the NICU team and everybody to get there. If you work in healthcare, you know that one little thing can, can disrupt your whole day, which is understandable, but got my spinal um, block. And I remember um, them just flipping me very quickly onto the OR table. And then I remember getting like this sudden headache or fuzzy feeling in my head. And then I started feeling like the, like I was retching and starting, I was feeling nauseous, like I had to, to vomit. And the nurse anesthetist behind me, she was great in talking to me. But as I'm laying there, I remember turning my head to my left side and I couldn't open my eyes, but I remember hearing people. And I remember my MFM, you know, talking to the nurse um, anesthetist or the anesthesiologist and asking, you know, what my pressure, my blood pressure is at, if I'm responsive or okay yet. So very weird feeling being on the other side. I, I couldn't necessarily respond or talk to people, but I could hear people. Um, so when I kind of came to the anesthesiologist had said my blood pressure significantly dropped my top systolic blood pressure. The top number that you read um, was 70 and she had actually had to start medications to, to keep my blood pressure up. It's um, thought that that was a reaction from the spinal block that I got. It's common. But more or less, my point with that is that it was a strange out of body experience in an already high stressful time. So, so they're, my husband's in with me, they're, they're starting um, the C-section of course. And we didn't know if we would even hear Gus cry because of lung development and whatnot. Like I said, his ultrasounds were all great. 
but our, our hope with even making it to that mark that we would hear a cry. And in my mind, if, if I heard a cry, that's of course reassuring. We knew that he would potentially need to be intubated and we were, we were fine with that at that point. So I remember my MFM telling me baby was almost out and he gave us, and it's the most beautiful sound in the world hear baby cry. He gave us three good cries and they had told us that he was a boy. And I just instantaneously was emotional, very optimistic. Um, my husband took pictures the whole time and he, the, the one thing that I of course wish would have happened, but I understand why, um, he was taken, Gus was taken with the NICU team right away, of course, which is very different. I had a vaginal delivery with Henry. So of course, when you have a vaginal delivery, baby gets put up on your chest, even with a routine C-section, you know, baby typically gets to come around and see mom, dad, and, and you get to touch your baby. I didn't get to do that. I understood why to give him the best care um, that we could. So he was taken right away. Um, I hadn't even looked at him. He was taken with the NICU team. So they were closing back up and my husband got to go be with him. And the NICU doctor had come out, they're closing me up. And he had said they had intubated Gus, um, but he was tolerating it. Okay. And they were going to, they were going to take him to what they call the DRICU, which is essentially an ICU honing in on dialysis or renal complications. So they were going to be taking him there. I was taken back to recovery and my husband was with me for, oh, maybe 30 minutes in recovery. And the NICU physician had come back. He gave us great updates as much as he could. Gus was born at 1040. He was six pounds, 15 ounces at 32 weeks. And while I was in recovery, the NICU physician came back and told my husband that maybe he should come back, see Gus, that he was still doing okay, but they were putting chest tubes in at this point. And, but things were still looking okay. Um, he was still tolerating ventilate the ventilator and whatnot. So I'm it's it's crushing um, or it's difficult to know when things are kind of cascading once again working in healthcare. I know chest tubes are not great things. So my husband went with him. I was with my fantastic nurse who was with me in the recovery room. And my husband's texting me, um, sending me photos, videos of him. Um, the whole time I'm in the recovery room and the goal was for me to be in the recovery room for about two hours, I believe. And so my husband had been with Gus for about an hour and a half and he had sent me some videos um, of him and of Gus holding his finger of him being on the ventilator pictures and whatnot. And I remember him texting me that messages such as that they were coding him or giving Gus CPR, trying to bring him back. So as a mom being in a recovery room and knowing that's happening to your baby, it's obviously very difficult. Um, and my husband working in healthcare too, he had worked in an even more rural setting than where we live. And he had many pediatric deaths codes. So my, my husband's experience, and of course this is me speaking for him. I can't speak from his experience, but my husband describes it as he's watching as they're putting in chest tubes and coating us. And my husband describes himself as feeling very helpless because he's, he's had to do that to children before. And all he wanted to do was go and help our son, but he, he couldn't, and he felt very helpless. So I'd received a message from my husband that they were coating Gus and I could hear a door to the recovery room that would open. And I was the only one in the recovery room at that time. So I knew when they were coming in to give me updates or news and I heard that door open. And I remember my husband drawing back the curtain to my recovery area and behind him were then it was the NICU physician and the pediatric nephrologist that I had visited with um, before. And I remember the look on my husband's face. He started to get very emotional once he, he saw me. And then I, of course, immediately got emotional because it's, it's crazy looking back. My husband didn't even need to say words 
and I knew what was going to be said to me. The NICU physician sat down to the left of me, and I honestly can't really tell you what he said as far as, as what was going on, because I remember just feeling the, the overwhelming feelings that my, my son wasn't going to make it. Um, I remember him saying that his CO2 levels were rising. They've tried every ventilator that they have. They put in the chest tubes. They performed a needle decompression, which essentially is trying to remove airspace from the lung. And between him and the pediatric nephrologist, he had said that he just doesn't have enough lung capacity to sustain his life. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. So I will, uh, once again, will never forget my amazing nurse, Jolene, the, the NICU physician at that point had, had said, um, recovery wise, they needed to do whatever they needed to do to get me to see my baby, um, that I needed to leave the recovery room and we needed to go be together as a family. Mind you, I'm less than two hours from a C-section. So my spinal is still, my spinal anesthesia is still active and I remember asking her if she could just throw me in a wheelchair because I just wanted to get down there as soon as I could, but I will never, um, I'll never forget Jolene pushing me <laughs> very fast down the hallway to get to Gus and just working in healthcare, how she kept her, she was compassionate, but she was able to keep her integrity and keep focused on what we needed to do in that moment. And I respect that a lot. And it, same with the physicians as well. And I remember going down the hall, my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law were there as well. So they were sitting in the waiting room and I remember going down the hall um, to go be with Gus and they had seen um, the expression on my husband's face and my face and they had knew as well, it was not good. So we had all gone down the hall in the NICU to go see Gus and there were 20 people at least outside of his room. So I, I knew they had a good team of people that were trying to do everything they could for him. And they asked if there was anything that we wanted, they wanted that we wanted them to do before we spent time with him. And I asked that he be baptized. We, we got to baptize him, be with him, touch him. He was intubated. So from a mother's perspective, the first time of me getting to touch my baby was him intubated and they had actually given him um, medications to help paralyze him, which it, it sounds very wrong, but in, in the healthcare world that made him more comfortable and it allowed him not to have to work to breathe against the ventilator. His heart rate looked so good. His blood pressure was great, but his oxygen, he just couldn't sustain normal oxygen level. So he was born at 1040. I don't know the exact time that we got to the NICU, but we, we got to spend about five hours with him in the NICU in a room. And those five hours then felt like 20 minutes. And we had extubated Gus and he passed away at 540. Yeah. So he lived for seven hours. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. yeah, I know it's, it's happened so recently for you. So, I mean, I know that it's gotta be, you know, still not that the pain ever gets better, but it's still, you know, it's just so recent. Yeah. It's, um, it's very raw. Like I said, it's, it's crazy looking back. It's crazy looking back on everything, how the five hours that we got to spend with him, it felt like 20 minutes. And now that it's seven weeks today um, since he was born. It feels like five years. Time is so, is strange after after a loss. It it's I can't you know as well as many other moms on your podcast that you don't know till you go through it. Um, I never knew that. I didn't think this would happen to me. As cliche as that sounds, so we after um, those seven hours, we got to go back to the high-risk um, OB unit, and they had a cradle, which would keep cold, essentially. The pediatric hospice team was great um, when he was still intubated and, and paralyzed, essentially. They were great in telling us that 
he can still feel your touch. He can still hear your voice. Of course, him being in the state that he is, he might not respond as a baby would, but but he he is there. So we, of course, savored every moment that, that we could. Um, we took a lot of pictures. We took a lot of videos. Looking back at some of the pictures and videos now, you know, you think, why did I take that? But I think even with my experience being so new, I would... I would have to tell you to take all the pictures and videos, even if you don't think you'll want to look at it someday, because you don't know, you don't get these times again. And you might want to look at it. You don't know how you're going to feel in the next seven weeks. You don't, I don't know how I'm going to feel in the next year. So take all the pictures and videos, do all the things that you want to do in that moment, um, because none of it's wrong. I think it's Um, always better to have them even if you never look at them, than to not have them and wish you did. Exactly. Yes. Just knowing that they're there can provide a sense of security um, for you, I feel. I know people Uh, have different experiences based on, you know, what, what hospital they're at, what doctors they happen to get. But it sounds like all around you had really amazing doctors and nurses like the whole time. I had, we were surrounded by such a fantastic team. I almost have I almost have to grieve the loss of them too, and not being with them every day because like I, and like you said, everybody's experience is so different. And every episode that I listen to and I hear a mom or a parent and they did, they haven't had a great experience. It breaks my heart because we had such a great experience when we were back up on the high risk OB unit. So got to hold him, love on him. Of course, my son, Henry was there. He made a frantic three hour drive down with other family members, because we of course wanted Henry to meet his brother and he had called it his baby for the whole 36 weeks. We of course let Henry see him after Gus was extubated. We didn't want, want the experience to be that so traumatic and raw. He'll of course have some trauma from all this, but we wanted to, to make it as, I can't find the right word for it, but as acceptable or as most as he could understand it or as most as he could take at that time without it being super traumatic. So Henry was with us. We got pictures as a family. Um, We got pictures with Henry and Gus. And every time, I don't think we received really any gifts or anything until the next morning, but we spent Gus back to, they call it the quiet room. We had him go to the quiet room at about 8 PM, I guess. And I know it's different for everybody. Like during our time here, we did have the option of keeping him with us all night. Um, the cradle he was in had like a, a cooling blanket. So it would preserve his body essentially, um, for lack of better words, me, myself, I knew that I already had to, to prepare myself to let go a little bit as hard as that was. And knowing that I only, my son lived for seven hours and I had only held him for five of those hours. I knew that as we go through this process, I'm not going to be able to just hold him again. So that was very difficult. Um, I remember him leaving on the room and me mentally thinking if I was even really going to see him again until our funeral arrangements. So overnight, I the staff um, was great and they knew that I probably didn't want to stay in the hospital where we had just lost our baby. Um, it was my first C-section. So typically you would probably stay in the hospital for two to three days. I got to go home the next morning. So they were great. And overnight I got up and walked around. Um, They removed my catheter. They essentially wanted me to stay for 24 hours, mainly for anesthesia precautions. Um, And the plan was for me to go home the next day. We had picked out what funeral home. So within that time frame of 8 PM to the next morning, when we got to go drive home, the amount of gifts and mementos that the high risk OB unit prepared for us was amazing. I think every time they came into our room, which was many times, they had a new gift or memento, Gus. They had um, overnight, they had made um, molds of his hands and his feet. And they had also made a mold of his side profile and their, their, they're very big molds and they had his weight 
the time he was born. They had little dragonflies etched into it. It was just really beautiful work um, that they did for us. They had a wooden box with a dragonfly on it with a, I'm blanking on the saying that it says on the inside of the box, held, held for a short time in our arms, but forever in our hearts, something along those lines. Somebody handmade the box. Um, they gave us many copies of his handprints, footprints, books for our son to help explain the death of Gus, a ring that is shaped to the size of, of his uh, fingers, one of his largest fingers. I know I'm even missing some of them, but so many great things. Blankets. I have the blanket that he was wrapped in in the NICU. It's amazing. A weighted bear that is his weight. They gave a bear to Henry from Gus. And this was all from the hospital? Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. They literally every time they came in, um, they had something else to give to us. And like I said, I, I know I'm forgetting some things that they gave us, but I, all of those things that they gave us, I have in a, in a plastic tote, the, his profile mold, which he had a ton of hair when he was born. So you can even see his hair um, in the mold. And it's so amazing to just be able to touch the mold. And um, this might sound odd to people, but we all do whatever we have to do through our grief process. And so it's, it's so nice to touch the mold and feel his hair and his ear and, and feel like I'm looking at his face um, when I'm able to look at that. So I feel like that's yeah, one of those things I wish they would give out at all hospitals. That's yes. Yes. I, like I said, as I've in the seven weeks, um, I don't even know when I started listening to your podcast, but you know, just to hear other women on your podcast, say what they've you know, they leave with only, with only a box. So if it's not detrimental enough to leave, to not leave with your baby, but to leave with a box or, you know, to only leave with, I think some women have said they get to leave with the teddy bear, but, and everybody's experience is so different. Everybody's going to feel so different in the process, but I, yeah, if it could just be standardized across the board to at least have all of these options that we received in gifts to be able for people to be able to go home with. I definitely think there should be some kind of minimum standard at least, you know, cause when you're, when you're going through it, I mean, many of us, it's our first time ever going through that kind of loss and we don't know what to do or ask for, or it would just be nice for hospitals to have some kind of protocol in place for that. Right. Right. And I just remember in that moment, you know, they would ask, I remember them asking, do you want us to do his the mold of his profile, his handprints, his footprints. And I feel fortunate enough to be able, I was able to prepare for four to six weeks that for this outcome, it of course doesn't make it any better. But in those four to six weeks, I was able to, to think about what I would do in this moment. And I just said yes to all the things. <laughs> Anything that they offered, I just said yes to because like we've said, it's even if you never look at it again, it provides security to me knowing that it's there and that we did that. Right. And uh, like you said too, it's your only chance to get it. Right. And you, yeah, you, you'll never get those moments back. So we, we came home the next day from Sioux Falls and the immense amount of guilt that I felt leaving my son there was astronomical. We had picked our, our funeral home back in our hometown, of course. So we had to make arrangements for, for them to even go get him, um, to bring him back home. So I also remember that immense amount of guilt that I felt. It felt so wrong, but at the same time, I knew I was going to go crazy staying in, in the place where everything happened. So we had, that was Father's Day weekend this year, and we had made it home on Friday, we spent Friday, Saturday with around so much family, um, so many friends. We were very open throughout this whole process of what had happened or what was going on. So we had coworkers calling us, messaging us, which seems very overwhelming at, at the time, but it's good to know that people care. And Sunday, which was Father's Day, 
And I didn't realize how gut-wrenching this was on my husband once again, but we had gone to the funeral home to make our funeral arrangements for Gus. And um, we had talked to the funeral director, gone over a brief outline of what we were going to do. And I remember that gut-wrenching feeling I felt on Friday leaving Gus and this was now Sunday. So I remember him, of course, letting us go see him. And I remember as I'm walking in the room to go see him since the last time I saw him, I, I remember almost falling to the floor and, you know, I'm two days post C-section. I'm, you can walk, but you know, everything's painful. It hurts. And I just remember almost doubling over and just looking at him. It felt so good to see him, but at the same time, it was in those moments of seeing him, it was, it was great to see him, but you get that, that wave and that shock of my baby's gone all in the same moment. And the funeral director made it very clear that we could, it's the perks of maybe living in a smaller community. We have about 26,000 people where I live. He told us to literally call him anytime we could go see him day or night. It didn't matter. So those moments were hang on to where I got to go and spend time with him and hold him. We had a prayer service and a funeral service for him. Um, we were surrounded by great coworkers, family, friends throughout. We have great members at our local gym that we go to. So many people were, were there to support us through that time. I Looking back on, on everything now, you're that first week of making funeral arrangements and, and whatnot, it's all, it was all about celebrating him. So as, as odd as it sounds, I'm sitting here planning a funeral, but it was comforting and almost knowing that I got to continuously think of him or, or make these plans in memory of him. It makes and we, sense. It's kind of one of the, one of the few things you get to actually plan for them. Right. And well, and I remember telling my husband that we were trying to essentially cram. You never stop loving your child, even after they're gone. But in that week, we were essentially trying to cram a lifetime of love with our child into that weekend and celebrating them. Because yes, you can. And I feel like people should, you should celebrate them every day, say their name, every day or as much as you want to. And if if you want, celebrate their birthday, celebrate holidays, celebrate those important milestones. Um, like you talk about Jasmine going, you know, this would be her going to kindergarten. I feel like people should celebrate all those things. But it, in that week, I just felt like we were trying to cram it all into one. <laughs> so um, yes, we buried him near our other family members in a cemetery that is close to our home. We can walk there. And yeah, he's he's very close to um, my father-in-law. He passed away 14 years ago. So it's it's very comforting and reassuring to know that they're so close. Like I said, we of course wanted Henry to be involved in everything with Gus. We all got to put something in the casket with Gus. I We have a golden retriever. Um, so I had actually found a it looks like a golden retriever it's a essentially like a mom golden retriever a larger dog stuffed animal and then there was a smaller one um so they were connected so i of course put the smaller type dog or dog stuffed animal in the casket and my husband put in a toy car me myself and my mother-in-law wrote letters to him and put them in the casket um, we had Henry draw a picture to put in with him. I wanted, I photocopied everything because I wanted to, of course, look back on all these things and remember how we felt, what we said to him. And Henry put in a, a toy with him as well um, that he's buried with. So we we just tried to do a lot of special things to try to make it as special as we can. I remember coming home after funeral and the first feeling I remember is I wanted, and this sounds so morbid, um, but I just wanted to go dig him up. I wanted to take him out. I wanted to hold him. And I, it's, it's natural. It, it might sound morbid to somebody who hasn't gone through this, but I feel like 
as a lost parent, people would maybe resonate with it or understand it. It feels wrong to just leave them. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember telling my husband, we had buried him in like a, the newborn outfit that we were going to take newborn pictures in, um, in like a knotted gown. And so that's what he was buried in, but I wanted to wrap him in a blanket as well. And I remember, you know, after he's buried telling my husband, oh my gosh, we, I forgot to wrap him in a blanket. And I was so upset about that. And my husband's great. And he just, you know, he reassured me that it it's okay. So I think for anybody going through this, it's yes, you want to say yes to all the things and, and you should, if you want to do that, to do all the things, but it's okay. You know, if you forget minor details, I'm okay. I definitely with it. think we all beat ourselves up over the things that we wish we had done. Right. And he, even small things, you know, it's, it seems small, smaller than it did six weeks ago. I still wish I would have done it, but I feel better about it now than I did then. But who doesn't just want to wrap their baby in a blanket to make them feel secure and hold them? So yeah, um, Gus is Gus is with us um, closely just down the road. Like I said, we can go um, walk to him. He's near his grandfather. And I believe there's been only one day um, that I haven't visited him. Uh, my husband likes to go visit him in the morning to say good morning. And I like to go see him at night. I feel like we're saying good night. You take yeah. Henry too? Um, Henry will go. You know, I don't, he's, he's three. So he's the fun toddler age. <laughs> Everybody says two is hard, but I think three is, is harder. Three is the <laughs> hardest. So, you know, I'll ask him if he wants to go. Um, if he says yes, you know, he'll of course go, but if, if he doesn't, I, we don't pressure him to go, you know, we've told, we've told Henry that, you know, Gus, it, we told him when we found everything out that the baby is sick, because once again, we didn't know how things were going to end. Um, we didn't know if we would have a stillbirth or if mommy and daddy would essentially live different lives with each of their kids. So we were open and honest with him as much as we could be with him understanding. Um, and then when Gus passed away, you know, we, we of course told him that Gus has gone to heaven with grandpa. So he, it's interesting to look at it in a, a perspective of a three-year-old's mind or try to view it from a three-year-old's mind of, he knows his brother isn't here right after the initial postpartum period. I know he would still touch my belly and think the baby was in there because he of course couldn't physically look at, at Gus and understand that he was here. So it's, it's complicated in that aspect of, of parenting after loss too. I started counseling right after our funeral for Gus was on Friday and I made a counseling appointment on Monday. I remember having the baby blues with Henry and I, then you throw in loss on top of all of postpartum anxiety, depression. I just had no idea where I would be. So my counselor has been a great resource. If I've learned anything in the last seven weeks, especially with parenting after loss, like we've said, three is hard in general. Um, and then with loss on top of that, you, you just need to give yourself grace. Every minute might be difficult. Every day might is going to be difficult. It gets a little lighter. I don't know if it gets better. I, I hate, I hate saying that, that it gets better. It gets lighter, I think, but yeah, my counselor has been a great asset. I think it's been a reality within the last seven weeks, realizing that some people that were maybe important in my life before, we maybe have different values and outlooks on life now. And I feel like that's okay. Everybody goes through a different season of life. And for people that I maybe not as close with anymore, I, I would still consider them friends or I'll still talk to them, communicate with them, but I maybe just don't hold them as close as I used to. Yeah, After the six can definitely years. change relationships for sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, even some friendships um, and not, not that they, um, that these people have 
you know, been hurtful or done anything wrong. Like I said, it's, I truly believe it's just different perspectives on different perspectives and experiences all change us and shape us every day. So going through all this, it's, I truly feel that I just don't hold certain people as close as I used to. So, yeah. And I definitely think that's like you said, that's okay. Yep. Yep. Even some family members you know, be okay with it. I have a complicated relationship with my whole family, uh, my side of the family. So that's, it's been interesting navigating that through loss as well. But I think if, if anybody needs to know anything as they go through this, you, you need to give yourself grace, say your child's name. Yeah. It's, I don't know if I heard it on, on your podcast or if somebody had shared it with me personally, but the best analogy that I've heard to grief is the boulder never, you never get rid of the boulder. The boulder just gets easier to carry, I believe is what it is. I've seen that. I like that one too. Yep. Yep. I think it's how I feel today than I did from seven weeks ago is different. Like I said, I feel like I've lived five years because every day feels like a week without my son being here, but it's, and knowing that I have a lifetime to go without him, it breaks my heart, but knowing that I'll get to be with him one day is, is really amazing as well. So trying to find the small moments of, of joy. Um, and I've heard many people on this podcast say it, say it as well, finding the small glimpses of joy and hanging on to them when you find them. Yeah, that's, I think that's super important. I know it's hard sometimes, but I think Mm -hmm. even the smallest thing you can be joyful for is something to hold on to. Right, right. I remember my first day of, of not feeling the immense, the immense weight of grief. Um, And it's, it's strange how grief can, you feel physical, you feel it physically. It's strange how that works. So I remember the first day of actually feeling like my head was above water and like I could actually function and maybe have a normal, you know, have a conversation without feeling super, super down. I remember that first day and it, it was amazing. You know, it, that was, that was like the first day of joy. So I think people forget that, you know, even though we live with our loss forever and we miss them every day, that we don't have to be sad every day for the rest of our lives. Right. Right. I've had that thought, like I said, I'm a nurse practitioner, so I I'll be going back to work in about a week and I've gone into my job a few times just to see people. And it's been nice to get some awkward conversations out of the way. You know, if you're a person that's gone through this sometimes, I think what people say comes from a good place, but it might not be the best thing to say. And I've had people personally say to me, I don't know what to say to you. And anymore, I will tell people that's okay. You don't, sometimes you don't have to say anything. Even if you're just physically here, that means a lot to me because I would rather have you just be here than say something that maybe might come off wrong to me, or maybe that you didn't mean to say so. Right. Yeah. People, people need to understand that just being there is probably the most important thing you can do. Yeah. And there's not the right words to say. There's nothing. I'm a true believer and there's nothing. um, There's nothing that somebody can say to, to make it okay or to make it any better. You know, hearing people say that they're sorry. It's, it's nice to hear. I know it's kind of what we just automatically say, but yeah, sometimes you don't need to say anything at all. So well, is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up? Um, you know, I'm in agreement, as I know many people on this podcast have said, pregnancy and infant loss, it's it's not discussed enough. I child loss included. It's uncomfortable. I know listening to past episodes of, you know, years. 30, 40 years ago, maybe, or even 20 years ago, you know, when people 
moms would have a stillbirth or infant loss, they would actually just take the baby away and not, you wouldn't get to spend time with your child. We just need to talk about it, um, make it known. It's uncomfortable. And I don't, I'm sure a lot of people that aren't affected by this, probably they don't want to, and that's perfectly fine um, because you don't, I feel like you don't really know how to react to the situation until it's happened, but I think we at least need to acknowledge it. And people that have gone through this, I'll tell you, your podcast has been a great resource and just listening to everybody's story um, or even listening to different therapists, counselors, or um, whoever you've brought on and talking about grief. Um, and it's provided, you know, an outlet for me knowing that I'm not alone because even though, you know, this, this has happened to somebody before when you're going through that initial raw moment of grief, you do really feel like you're the only person that has experienced this in, in the whole world. Yes. I felt that exact same way. So just knowing that there's a a group of people behind you that are rallying and, you know, not everybody feels everybody's story is different and what you feel and I feel are, are probably different, but knowing that this one common thing brings everybody together is it's really beautiful when you think about it, I think. So I always say it's like, it's nice to know everybody, but I wish we had met under different circumstances. Right. Right. If we could all be friends or have something else in common, that would be amazing. But (laughs) the reality is we can't. So let's just try to get through it as much as we can. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much for having me. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for sharing your story with us. Finding out during pregnancy about a diagnosis like this is so hard. We found out about Jasmine's CDH at 13 weeks, and it just completely changes the pregnancy for you. All the time, you're hoping you'll be the case that's different, the case that will prove how strong your baby is and how much they can overcome. I don't think even faced with some of these diagnoses that we even think we will lose them. We think we'll have a medically complex child. We prepare for NICU time or surgery or whatever it is that our baby will need. We plan for that. We don't plan for them to die. And I think the hope and the love that we have for them, even against all odds sometimes, is a beautiful thing. I truly think they feel all of it that we're sending their way. All I ever know is the sound of our heartbeat and our voice, and the feelings of love that we send them. And I personally take comfort in that, knowing just how much our babies can feel our love. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you like the show, please leave a review or rating on Apple or Spotify. It only takes a moment and really helps the show reach more loss and infertility families. Thank you so much for tuning in and remember, we are all in this together.